Welcome to this transatlantic media debrief on the 2020 U.S. presidential election. My name is Terry Martin. I'm an anchor with DW, with Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of words to tell you what's coming up and who important people standing behind this. Uh, I want to give a special welcome to those turning in tuning in from the young networks of the partners, whom I'm going to tell you more about in just a moment, and also a special welcome to Aspen International representatives who helped spread the word about this event and have turned tuned in, turned into from all of Europe, I suppose. We are coming to you live from the Berlin Town Hall, the iconic Rotes Rathaus here in the heart of Berlin. And I want to give a special thanks to the Senat Chancellery for helping to make this event possible. It's our great privilege to have with us today the governing mayor of Berlin, Michael Müller. He will deliver some opening remarks in German with English simultaneous translation. And then I will introduce our esteemed journalists for the other speakers who will start the discussion. So, Herr Regierende Bürgermeister, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Red Town Hall, the Mayor's Hall, as we call it here in the Town Hall. A warm welcome to all the online listeners uh, who will have tuned into the thought-provoking debate today. America went to the polls, and it was a highly anticipated election that also aroused concern because of the announcement by John by Donald Trump made before the election. We already knew it wouldn't be an easy election and an easy election night. And indeed, it did turn out to be quite a nail-biter. And even today, it turned out to be a neck-and-neck -neck race. People talked about, um, people thought Biden would win the election easily, but this did not happen. And we saw the, or we are now seeing the Donald Trump administration still failing to concede. So we are all still watching in awe, but we can say that Joe Biden will be the new president of the United States of America. And this result does, is of utmost importance for Europe, Germany and Berlin, because it does inspire hope of a fresh start for transatlantic relations. For the presidency of Donald Trump called many things into questions that had been taken for granted for decades. One of the key questions that we will now have to look into is the future of the transatlantic alliance. What will the, how, will the trans, how will the United States shape multilateral security policy within NATO? Will they continue to shape it or reshape it? And certainly we've all learned to understand that regardless of who will be president, that we need to ask ourselves a few questions and that we need, need to agree on a few things within the EU first and that the EU needs to take greater responsibility in these key questions, which is especially not easy given um, Brexit. So there's a lot to do within the EU first. Ladies and gentlemen, in the international community as a whole, too, may hope for a new beginning under President Joe Biden. It makes a great difference whether the US administration sees itself as part of the international community and whether it's a member of the international organization of international organizations it makes a difference whether the US administration honors the rules the international community have given themselves and it does make a difference whether they want to play a role role, role in this international community and promote and honor agreements it is at times like these that trust and reliability are of the essence, and especially when it comes to solving crises, crises that we can only solve and weather together by joining forces, thinking of the coronavirus pandemic, 
With more than 50 million coronavirus cases, more than 1.2 million deaths globally, it is very clear that no one can solve this alone. We can only do so and succeed by coming together, by joining forces. And international cooperation is equally important when it comes to the global climate crisis. Yes, we need international exchange, international cooperation between scientists, academics, not just policymakers. And yes, trust does play a role. I would like to stress this and say this especially here in this context before a panel that is discussing the political impact of the election. My experience is that, especially in the times of crises, trust in each other, in political actors, is of utmost importance. You need trusted relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, it, this applies also to many other policy areas. Our relationships plays an important role, the relationship between the EU and Germany and the US, talking about the China-US climate dispute or the protectionist financial policy under American First. All of this has direct implications for, German, um, for the German domestic market because the US is an important export market, not just for Germany, but also for Berlin. Besides the EU, Berlin business um, export income um, is mainly earned from the US market. So economics play an important role here as well. Let me conclude by saying that we as Berliners have enjoyed a special relationship with the United States of America. This has become clear throughout history. There's always been a special bond to our American friends. After the end of the world of World War II, we relied on the on help by the United States, and we were able to rely on them. Many people in Berlin can recall the times of the Berlin airlift, where we received a lot of support from the United States. Many can still recall the visit by John F. Kennedy and his speech in front of the Schoenberg Town Hall. And also after the war came down, and let me stress this, the support from our American friends was vital because it wasn't a matter of course what role Germany would play after the war came down and what role Berlin would assume in this new Germany. How should this new German capital develop? We, were, we are thankful for the trust placed in us. It has enabled us to develop into this global metropolis that we are today. And this is also thanks to the support by our American friends. So ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to this relationship. In 2017, we celebrated the 50th anniversary with our um, city sister city um, Los Angeles. It is our oldest city partnership, which was founded 50 years ago, as I said. We have a very friendly, strong bond um, and close ties with Eric Garcetti. We enjoy a special partnership, but there are exchanges in many different fields, science and academia, culture, education, and this is extremely important, especially looking at the major cha challenges we're facing. At times when the, the American um, government denied the climate crisis, the climate change, we as major cities joint forces, we came together and presented a united front and we said we need to take, assume responsibility to protect our citizens, both Berliners and um, Los Angeles and the other big cities in the world. So ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be able to welcome you here at the Berlin Town Hall, of course also the online listeners at home. I'm delighted that we have the chance to talk about a new beginning today and I also believe that we can be very optimistic and confident about the future. I wish our panelists here um, an interesting and thought-provoking discussion, but I wish all of us that this discussion gives rise to new impetus 
for greater and closer cooperation in the future. So all the best. Thank you. Herr Regierender Bürgermeister, vielen, vielen Dank, dass Sie auch bei uns waren und dass wir hier sein dürfen. Das Wort Vertrauen haben Sie mehrmals erwähnt. Ich glaube, das werden wir auch heute eventuell noch mal hören. Anyway, I just want to thank you very much for being with us and allowing us to hold this event in your beautiful Rathaus. So, just a reminder to everyone who is joining us in the virtual world out there and maybe watching this afterwards. I'm just going to have a seat here. I uh, just want to remind you that this event is part of a series. Uh, it's a rather significant series that started back on September 1st. It's called Road to Election Night and Beyond. Obviously, we are beyond the election night now, but there's still a lot to talk about, obviously. Um, this series has its own website, by the way, uh, and the videos of the events that have been held up until this point are archived there. I presume this one will be as well if you want to look at anything it said here a little later. Very worthwhile looking at that video archive, by the way. There is one particular event that I, I looked at yesterday. It was taped on the election evening on, on November 3rd, and uh, the creme de la creme of the transatlantic community, the German, German American transatlantic community is represented there, very much worth listening to. Now, the road to election night and beyond is a joint initiative of 12 transatlantic partners who deserve to be mentioned here. Uh, you can see their logos next to me. Uh, I'll just go through them because, again, they, they deserve mentioning. The Aspen Institute Germany, of course, the American Academy in Berlin, the German American Chamber, uh, the German the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany, the Atlantic Brücke, the American Council on Germany, the, Amer the German Atlantic Association, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, Foundation, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the Hans Seidel Foundation, America House NRW, North Rhine-Westphalia, and the Bavaria Center for Transatlantic Relations. So if you're wondering who is thinking about what's coming up, uh, these organizations are, and you can visit their individual websites where you also find a lot more on the issues that we're going to be discussing today. So here we are, 10 days after that tumultuous presidential election in the United States. Uh, the results are still not certified. Uh, we wouldn't expect them to be certified at this point. But we did hear from the head of the committee that is responsible for checking them today that there has been no irregularity that they can find, uh, just to offer some assurances there. The, um, there is a consensus that Joe Biden uh, has secured enough electoral votes to become the next president of the United States, that he has defeated Donald Trump, that he has also secured the popular vote, which for many people is, is important to know. Uh, there, the question, though, is about what's going to happen next. We've got most world leaders who have already congratulated Joe Biden. We just heard from China today, also chiming in, extremely important uh, case there. Of course, here in Europe, we've got almost everyone already having congratulated Joe Biden on his win. But Mr. Trump has so far refused to concede, and he claims that, uh, without evidence, that, there, that the election has been stolen from him uh, through a massive fraud. Uh, he's con still continuing at this point today to, to say that. This is uh, the 13th of November. Well, for the media, the election was unlike any other, you know, it's, and, which is great for me to be able to sit with you guys and talk about how we experience that. That's what we're going to be doing. Not only did it happen during a deadly pandemic, but it involved an incumbent president who questioned the leg legitimacy of the electoral process, actively propagated misinformation, declared the media to be the enemy of the people. These are points that I think sit very deep with any representative of the media who believes in fact-based journalism. Well, for those of us who covered the election from either side of the Atlantic, uh, it's been challenging and interesting to say the least, and many times it's been disturbing and indeed bizarre. Uh, <laughs> now there's a lot of excitement about what will unfold in the next chapter of this transatlantic story. And on that note, it's my pleasure to finally introduce our four esteemed journalistic colleagues. Uh, starting on my left and moving around the circle, we have Melissa Eddy, 
Uh, she's the Berlin correspondent of the New York Times. Before taking on that post in 2012, she was, the, she was with the Associated Press News Agency in Germany and Austria. Tina Hassel is head of the Hauptstadt Studio, the Berlin Studios, of Germany's public broadcaster AFD. <laughs> um, ARD, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, also ARD's uh, Washington bureau chief uh, for several years, I think during the Obama administration. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, ARD, just to be, make, make that clear, we, we also know about AFD. We probably won't be talking too much about them today. Well, Tonya Mastroboni in, is the Berlin correspondent for the Italian daily La Repubblica. She is also an author and runs a book lecture series uh, for Trento's Festival of Economics. So we can maybe get some economic perspective coming through on this. And Wojciech Szymanski is a correspondent with Deutsche Welle's Polish service, one of my colleagues. Uh, before joining DW in 2017, he was a foreign correspondent with Poland's public broadcaster, Polski Radio. So, Thanks to all of you for, for being here. Uh, our audience will notice that we are very much social distancing here. We all just took our masks off after taking our seats uh, a good two meters from each other. So we are observing the uh, hygiene requirements that um, while Berlin and rest of Germany is in a, a lockdown light, so to speak. Well, let's start things off uh, by having each of you just speak for a couple of minutes about how you experienced this U.S. election, what it, you know, standout moments in this election for you in covering it, and maybe a little bit about what it means to you and, and your readers or your viewers, starting with you, Melissa. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's um, a pleasure and an honor to be here. I, of course, cover Berlin and not Washington, so um, I didn't have as tough a job as many of my colleagues here probably did because I um, actually did not have a whole lot to do on election night other than watch what was happening like um, so many of, of us were doing. Uh, for me, the unexpected and, and uh, really challenging moment came in a, on Saturday when I had said, all right, enough. I have to like get off of CNN. I'm just going to like take a break. And the next thing I know, my phone is blowing up and uh, the election had been called. So then I had to race uh, to put CNN back on and then only after digesting this on a personal level did I remember, oh wait, I need to get reactions in and up quickly because of course the New York Times, we had um, a live briefing going on with our election coverage, which uh, for the Times drew a record 75 million readers on election day. And if that was not uh, a record enough, it was actually broken the next day when we drew 120 million readers. Uh, so I think that reflects um, the, the deep, deep interest that, that the world had in this election, in the outcome of this election. And uh, I did uh, get, uh, get my reactions up there and, and in on time, of course. Um, and it was, it was quite an election. It was an exciting time uh, to be a journalist, definitely. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I, of course, covered um, this election from Berlin. I had my airbed uh, in my office um, and got uh, three hours of sleep, of rest. Uh, I had a couple of politicians' interviews um, before midnight and then uh, lots of uh, politicians and interviews already starting at uh, six o'clock and going on for our special programming. And this is just worth mentioning because it first shows that this election was the election and still is the election. There was no other topic, even uh, Corona was uh, second placed. Um, and um, different from other elections before where German politicians are kind of reluctant to go already on air before um, the situation is clear, this time um, there was no hesitation at all and they all came out um, speaking and um, and that reflects as well, you mentioned already, Terry, that um, um, German Chancellor, together with uh, other um, European leaders, did already congratulate um, in a situation where um, things are, were not settled. Um, and uh, this as well showed, and this was, uh, by the way, um, a very close coordinated move, and they all uh, did it at the same time and in a very clear statement, and that shows how important this election is for the German and European um, 
politics and how how relieved, overwhelmingly relieved everyone uh, was and still is, but a little less uh, right now because there is uh, some qu there are some question marks of about what might happen uh, till uh, the inauguration and and uh, so until January but there is a, a huge relief uh, nearly um, reaching through the aisle across the aisle through all parties maybe there's one single party not being that relieved um, the AFD uh, as you mentioned it before um, and there are uh, very hopes are high um, but at the same time everyone um, we spoke to said um, we are not naive there will be we can't just sit back and um, I mean relax again there will be no way back to glorious good old times and um, we all we means we Europeans we Germans we do have to deliver and there things are <laughs> becoming interesting because as you might all know next year is uh, a very it's an election year, um, an important, and so Germany has to really rethink his um, po politics in um, during an upcoming election without the chancellor and with uh, no clear political heads for nearly all parties. Okay, Tanya. Well, I had uh, three takeaways from the, not the electoral night, but maybe the electoral week, where we're all waiting for Arizona or Pennsylvania to, <laughs> to give us the right. Uh, push. Well, the first one is um, uh, in the night. In the night, I, I, I flashed because I remembered the darkness. Democracy dies in darkness. Uh, slogan of the Washington Post, of course, no, which was uh, something that 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 we we saw during these four years, and now we. But we know also that the illusion that this will go away is wrong. Of course, I mean, Trump took I think 70 million votes. Trumpism will survive to Trump. And this is, I think, the first take away that we can you know, uh, easily um, learn from this election. And this is not a detail because there are many populistic parties, like Tina said, IFD, but we have also in Italy, we have two populistic parties at least at opposition and one in the government. And so Trumpism is not over. So we have to remember this. You know, when we always think of the slogan of uh, democracy dies in darkness, this will stay, I think, the slogan. I don't know what the Washington Post decided, but I imagine it won't go away. The second takeaway is the good news, I think, for us, traditional media, because we won. I mean, um, this was a, 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 the, the most important election, I think, in a decade. And for the first time, we saw the social media, in a certain sense, um, um, limiting the fake news or trying a little bit uh, hypocritical way, but they, they, they started to cancel them. Uh, we saw what's happened on Twitter the days after Trump, uh, the days after the election. So there, there is something uh, like, uh, there, is a, there is a selection that, that slowly uh, is coming. Uh, the traditional media didn't go too wrong in the, uh, no, also in the, in what they said about the elections and to, I, I mean, I'm speaking especially about Italy where many, but I think also the United States or Germany. Um, so I think the traditional media with their, uh, uh, with their standing, with their, with their insisting on, on, on impartial, impartiality, on, on, on facts and so on. Uh, I think this time they, 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 they conquered something. And the third takeaway is, uh, is not so good news. It is the reaction of my government, I mean, Italy because it was um, a, a wrong reaction, or it was a weird reaction. The first tweet that Giuseppe Conte, the, pre the prime minister did, was a tweet about how happy he was for the American people who, has, who had voted. I mean, this is, of course, not exactly a traditional congratulation with a new president-elect, no? And his vice president. So, but maybe we can talk in a second round about this. I mean, Italy is really risking more and more to be a big country in Europe more and more irrelevant because um, it is, this is a symbol, a, a symptom how, how Conte reacted. Um, it was almost a, an embarrassed reaction. Uh, it is a symptom of, of how Italy is behaving. Italy is trying to maintain a sort of equidistance between Trump and uh, Biden, which is more and more ridiculous. And it is trying to also maintain an equidistance between two superpowers who are confronting like China and United States. And this will have, I think, consequences for the next time if we don't take position. I think, and I conclude, Italy has the wrong idea that being equidistant 
and being cautious in this phase could mean um, being powerful in future, but I think it's exactly opposite of the case. Thank you. Boce? Yeah, like uh, every journalist, I was uh, observing the, the the election night very very closely, and w well, I have some 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 thoughts about it. Well, first of all, uh, I'm I'm very sorry about what has happened and what happened before the election because uh, what President Trump uh, did, uh, and I am saying this with my perspective of a journalist working in Germany, covering Poland, I'm Polish journalist in Germany, uh, covering some international relations as well. Um, uh, you know, it's destroying the most uh, fundamental democratic electoral standards by saying things that uh, were were said. And I was, I was very sorry for the for the American uh, democracy, for the American um, uh, electoral system, with uh, president saying things like "stop, stop counting the votes. It's it's a fraud." Uh, or watching the presidential campaign between Mr. Biden and, and, and Donald Trump, the first one, which was like uh, like a fight in a in a in a, in a kinder in, in, a, in a kindergarten, uh, and and why I'm saying it, it's uh, because uh, I saw it before in in Poland, uh, 2000, 2015, when uh, the ruling now Law and Justice Party, the National Conservative Party, which is ruling now. Uh, was also didn't have any any problems with uh, with with destroying this trust in the state in its uh, fundaments in its um, institutions in its standards. Uh, then 2015 by 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 saying uh, there were also accusations of a fraud. Uh, there were accu some other accusations against uh, the, the the government uh, back then. So this is what I this is what I take from this from this election. Uh, populists trying to win the election. They don't care about the state. They don't care about the institutions. They are able to destroy them just to win. And uh, there's another interesting thing from my point of view as, as, as a Polish, uh, Polish journalist. Well, Poland is one of uh, very few countries in Europe which are actually, actually not at all happy about <laughs> Donald Trump uh, losing this election. Uh, the Polish government, the, the PIS, uh, peace uh, government, uh, was a very close and is a very close ally of, of Donald Trump. And uh, Warsaw uh, did everything to build a special relation with uh, with, with with Washington and Donald Trump, uh, paying uh, also a lot of money for for, for that to you know to, to gaining this attention from from Washington, and to being the, not Germany, <laughs> not to be the Germany which is being bashed by by Donald Trump all the time, but being Poland which Donald Trump uh, loves and say this is how an ally in NATO in Europe should uh, should 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 look like, and I really. Uh, I'm very interested. What will the Polish diplomacy now now do after you know uh, putting the money, all the money on the on the on the wrong uh, on the wrong horse in the in the race? And this is also interesting. The the Polish president congratulated Joe Biden, but you know he didn't congratulate him for winning the election. All he said was congratulate on a successful uh, campaign. <laughs> That's not what you may expect from a. Uh, yeah, a lie happy about Joe Biden winning this election. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. I think you, we've opened up the, the can of worms, as it were, with uh, lots, of, lots to choose from uh, in this election. It's very clear that this election has implications uh, far beyond America's borders. Anything that uh, happens in American leadership obviously has implications uh, for the transatlantic relationship. I want to begin our discussion. I know you want to respond to something that Wojciech said. Uh, Melissa, we'll come, come back to that in just a moment. But I want to, want to begin by, by picking up on something that Tina said. And and that concerns us, the apprehension, a maybe worry in Germany now that the euphoria over the fact that Biden has won the election is beginning to dissipate and now we're seeing some concerns. Maybe you can give a greater voice to those concerns. What, what, are, what is Germany worried about? Well, these concerns are, of course, not openly um, um, discussed, of course. But, I mean, there is a, a feeling of... Uh, with um, Donald Trump, everything is possible. And um, as um, apparently, if you if you go and say if, if, if there's someone not playing by the rules, and um, 
you, we all do know that uh, there is an end date, um, a final date, um, but uh, it's a long way. And I mean, it's highly unusual for at least European ways of transitions. They um, don't take that long. So it's a long time in a bumpy and, and, and complicated world. And you just don't know. And here people don't know. Uh, domestically, of course, there we, we as a German, we um, of course just can sit and, and watch and, and um, but, but if you probably think it in a more complex international um, way, there are areas where you could have a question mark and the president, um, Trump still has the power to, uh, to kind of uh, start conflicts or do some crazy things. So, of course, uh, people are watching this uh, with um, very closely. Uh, this is one thing. And then on the other hand, um, already um, I think everyone is preparing for a very good um, start as soon as uh, the inauguration has taken place because we all do know that then the test case, the real test case, uh, is going to start. And the test case means that then um, uh, the future President Biden has to prove, and we have to prove as well, that multilateralism is working and um, that it's uh, that we all can deliver something concrete and something better than just go uh, and have bilateral agreements uh, and that language of power. And um, so um, everyone knows it, so I think there's already we do know um, president or the president-elect quite well, which is very important for the uh, German part. We had, uh, someone mentioned it already, <laughs> nearly no real um, exchange with the current um, administration. Uh, we came to know very important announcements like uh, reducing the troops, parts of the troops, um, mm by um, by newspaper um, and so everyone is preparing for a good start because once again it's more about just refreshing the transatlantic partnership it's um, kind of uh, this responsibility that goes with this uh, as, yeah, as and it's, and it's, it's out. The, to uphold the West as uh, as a working good entity. challenge so Looking again, there is quite a bit of time between now and January 20th. Uh, we're in a situation today as we speak where Donald Trump has not conceded, uh, he has not accepted that he has lost, he is actively blocking the transition. We're, he's not allowing Joe Biden to receive uh, intelligence briefings, security briefings at this point. He's fired his defense secretary. He has numerous lawsuits that are still operating. Uh, there are some polls that suggest Republicans, a majority of Republican voters in the U.S. do believe that there was massive voter fraud. Uh, these are, you know, these are reasons to be concerned. Um, Melissa, you, you wanted to pick up on something that Wojciech said? Well, it comes back to the, the massive voter fraud idea. I have to say one thing that really heartened me is despite what Donald Trump said, we saw the system held. The election was certified as the safest election that has ever happened in the United States. And the other thing that absolutely delighted me was seeing the, like, first of all, I bet everybody in this room and everybody watching us knows now where Maricopa County was, in uh, Arizona is, which who many, you know, how many of us knew about that beforehand, right? And to see these local officials, state and county officials, who are average Americans on either side of the blue or red, the, the Democratic or the Republican divide, doing their jobs. They were counting votes, they were counting them carefully, and the entire world was hanging on their every word. And there was tremendous voter turnout and there in was the middle of a pandemic. there was tremendous voter turnout in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So I feel like, yes, there's reason to, to be concerned, no doubt, but at the same time, I feel like there was push against the system, mm -hmm. but from what we have seen right now, the system has held, the system is holding. Melissa, we saw going into this election uh, that stores were boarding up their fronts, fearing that there might be unrest. You know, we have seen unrest in the United States, social unrest on the streets uh, in, the, in, the, in recent months, but there was concern that there would be post-election unrest connected to a situation like we have now, where you have a Joe Biden has won, he's recognized at least as president-elect, but you have the president refusing to, to accept defeat at this point, so there is concern. I want to ask you before we move on, 
Do you have concern that there could still be social unrest in this situation? Look, I'm from Minnesota. So when I went home to Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, where there was all that unrest, the streets where I hung out as a kid, uh, suddenly to see them, you know, buildings burned and all, was pretty shocking. And I previously would not have thought that possible. So I think we saw something, we saw a potential for violence, we saw an anger from both sides coming out into the streets, not for the first time, we'd seen this in the 60s. I think that potential certainly is there, but I would say right now I am less concerned about it than I was before the election took place. I feel like, yeah, there is still tension. You know, I've heard from friends, family, people back in the States who uh, voted for Donald Trump, who do not, you know, feel happy with the vote, who still believe that not everything was as clean as the officials are telling us. And... I, to me, this is part of the uncertainty, is in this time, and you know, we do have, however, a shorter time span in some senses, because in terms of the election, we have state procedures that are taking place in early December where we're going to get some clarity. That still leaves the president in the White House with the possibility to do you know, everything that a president is allowed to do, and we don't know how that will play out. Um, however, I, th I think if we can keep the situation in check as it has been so far, the system will continue to hold. Just want to in, in, invite you uh, to, to interject you, if you, any of you have any, have any particular concerns. I also want to mention that uh, just prior to our recording this, to, to this session taking place, uh, we invited this, the Aspen Institute and some of the other partners to get input from the youth networks from the different organizations that are standing behind uh, me right here and these so we got a number of questions from these young networks and partners of this event series including junior members next-gen initiative participants young leaders and junior fellows and I'm going to be integrating some of these questions into this discussion and one of them that I found particularly interesting and that fits into what we've just been talking about is um, is concerns Italy uh, Italy has a is an interesting case where it also your leaders in Italy, some of them have cultivated pretty close relationships with, uh, with the United States, with Donald, with the Trump administration. Um, I'm just wondering to what degree people in Italy were watching this election. I know here in Germany, where I live, it was very intense, but Italy, of course, is suffering greatly in the corona pandemic. Uh, there, there are you know, other concerns. Was this, was this election closely watched in Italy? Yes, of course, it was because also of the things that I mentioned before, because of the, um, I mean, Donald Trump was, was a big, uh, was very important for uh, La Lega, for Matteo Salvini in these years. He celebrated uh, Trump and also the friendship with Russia. We know this ambivalence is an Italian one. So, uh, But also Giorgia Meloni, which is the upcoming superstar of the new right movement in Italy. And we, we will have to watch closely at her and not at Salvini uh, in the next years. And um, so I think that many were relieved because they thought also of the, of the re re reflex on, this, on these parties of the, of the defeat of Trump. But of course, I mean, now the Five Star Movement is in a big confusion, moment of confusion, because they supported a lot Trump, and, um, but they also supported a lot of the Chinese. So they, uh, again, uh, you have this, uh, this, uh, this very difficult situation now for the, for, the, for the Italians because we knew that there was a, a great irritation in the, in the Trump administration when um, we, we did the agreement uh, on the port of Trieste uh, about the Silk Road, um, when, when the, the foreign minister in a certain sense embarrassed himself during the corona crisis, uh, you remember, maybe or you're, you're not, remember it's not important, but it was very important for the, also for the Americans and for the Germans, uh, when he went to the airport and welcomed the plane with the, with the Chinese masks. This was a very embarrassing moment, I think, for the Italian diplomacy. But uh, the foreign minister didn't get it, and so he, he went on also uh, uh, saying that Trump is a wonderful president. Today he made an interview saying that... Um, uh, he welcomes uh, Biden, but he would also work greatly with Trump. Uh, so I think that this, this, the Italians were very, very... I mean, Ita Italy has a very long tradition with, um, 
and in good relationship with America. It comes also from its history because after the war for 50 years, we had the greatest communist party in Western world in Italy. So uh, we will under special observation by the, by the world and by the Americans, but we will also, I mean, the Democrat, the Democratic party was also a big friend, of course, of the United States and it was a very, very important ally to us. So I think this is um, an election that will Hopefully, it will strengthen um, uh, some traditional parties. It will strengthen the self-consciousness of a party that is called also Partido Democratico, Democratic Party. But it has it has been it has had so far a very weak answer to this election. It has cautiously congrat congratulated Biden for the victory, but I mean, um, it's all very in this moment confused. But of course. The United States are very important for Italy. The United States important for Poland as well for some of the reasons that you've already mentioned, Wojciech. Uh, tell, tell us how it was in, in Poland. I know, I guess you were here during the election uh, monitoring what was happening in Germany. But what can you tell us about the way the election was viewed by, in Poland, both by the government and just the average people? Um, this election was was observed extremely closely in Poland. Where, well, every American election is watched, uh, observed closely in Poland. Uh, America, Poland is a very pro-American uh, country in Europe. Polish security relies on uh, on U.S. and on NATO. Poland is uh, has these concerns with a big uh, Russian neighbor uh, uh, in the east. So Poland is traditionally very. Uh, pro-American, but this election was was special because uh, in in this case it was a little bit a, a internal Polish election as well. Uh, Poland is a very like like many other countries in the world now, like U.S., a very very polarized and divided country, and all the uh, people voting in Poland for the governing national uh, conservative law and justice party were for Trump, and they were hoping. Uh, for the for, for Trump to win, also because they are this kind of soul brothers, I would say, uh, the conservative part of, of of Polish voters. They are those who, who who who, yeah, they don't want the uh, leftist, nihilistic uh, society, socialistic to occur. They want the traditional families. They are against abortions. Um, uh, uh, they liked they, they liked the Republicans, so they were very pro-Trump, and the entire uh, liberal left, liberal Poland was, of course, uh, extremely against Trump. Uh, I and just want to inter inter ask you a question in, in the middle of that yeah. because um, you know, I don't understand the the Pol I don't understand Polish, so it's very difficult for me to follow the uh, Polish journalistic landscape, the media landscape. I do, however, uh, get the impression that media are pretty tightly controlled in 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 Poland. I'm just wondering to what degree the the state-controlled media uh, had an impact on public opinion and public perception of this election. Well, this is very interesting and it's a very good question because uh, we were even telling jokes that uh, there is only one more uh, TV station in the world which still doesn't recognize uh, Joe Biden's victory. It's the Polish TVP. Uh, even Fox News has already said, "Yeah, okay, it's it's Biden," and <laughs> and uh, because the the Polish state television. It's totally controlled by the by the government. Uh, they were very, very. Uh, maybe they are still fighting and still saying to their viewers, "Ah, oh, we'll see. There were some uh, irregularities. It could have been a fraud. We'll see what comes at the end." Um, so, so this is the view that Polish viewers uh, have uh, got from the from the public media. Uh, but uh, Poland has this very uh, differential, di differentiated media landscape. There are also other outlets, other uh, TV stations, so uh, I you can get the other point of view, uh, point of view as well. But it's also in the media; it's very, very polarized. It's very, very much divided. Mo uh, go ahead. Yes, no, I, w I wanted to, um, because it, I'm also very interested in the opinion of my colleagues and your opinion. Um, I mean, th there is a, there is a, um, a thing about uh, B Biden's victory that, that always um, has, has, has occupied my mind in these days. 
what will stay, no? I mean, the problems that, that Trump opened, for example, his confrontation with China, no? Uh, I spoke also some people to some people here, they said, well, uh, we could have as well, it was a wake up for Europe, no? How Trump treated China, because China is in, ex in an expansionary phase, so we will have this problem too, to face uh, seriously. So it was a wake up call, but Trump um, made it so uh, isolationist that we couldn't go with him and confront China on some topics like commercial topics or even defense matters, no? But what will happen now? Because now it could be interesting on that, on that side. Or also, some problems won't be gone now, oh, I think, no. like, for example, Nord Stream 2. Or, for example, we'll, I do want to talk expense. about all of this. I'm, I want to yes. talk about uh, the challenges that are going to be facing Europe and, and the United States together uh, in this new administration. We still have quite a bit of time. I do want to definitely get to that. But before we get to that, I still want to just break down the, what happened in terms of the media landscape a little bit more. Um, you talked about, M Melissa, how you know, the numbers of readers on your uh, website, I, I presume. Uh, I was also following the New York Times uh, website because you had a wonderful dashboard uh, that laid out which states had been called by which news organizations. I think you had a dozen news organizations represented there um, across the spectrum, including Fox News. And it was very interesting to see you know, which, which news organization had called which state first or which time. Uh, it was very interesting to watch it in that sense. I just want to ask you how important do you think that the coverage I mean, we, it's of the New York Times and other media as well in this election, uh, how important that was to to the democratic process? I think it was extremely important. And I think, um, you know, this has been touched on already that in many ways, uh, social media was sort of kept in, a bit in check. And it was really traditional media across the board that everyone was looking to, you know, the AP's traditional role in, in uh, calling elections that you know, the New York Times was, was very cautious with. I know NPR in the United States also, you know, and as you said, bringing in Fox News and just looking to see. Um, everyone was was actually tuning in to these traditional media outlets to figure out what's happening. They weren't just refreshing, well, I mean, a lot of people were. Obviously, there were those who were just refreshing their Twitter feeds and, and, their, and their Facebook feeds. But we also saw social media, um, some of these companies, step in and decide to take a role and, and to shut down or to at least, if not entirely shut down, to flag uh, content that they felt was baseless. And this is something that has not happened you know, ever before. And, and I think it was a real, a real turning point uh, in that sense for media. Now, the question will be, where do we go from here? Um, what, what will the next steps be? And, and um, I think these are decisions that media companies are looking at and thinking about. Um, right now, everyone is still focused on the next few weeks, getting us through to 20th of January. And, uh, and then sort of, you know, we can, we can head into this new phase. Uh, but I would say it, it, uh, it was an incredibly important election for, for traditional media. Yeah. yeah, and just to add on that, um, I think um, in our reporting, it was um, um, very interesting to, to really get the full picture, what we, of course, got from the, from the big outlets, from the um, American outlets. But here in Germany, there was that narrative that only old white men uh, were voting for uh, President Trump and that his way and his style and knowing him um, so well um, um, for the last four years would um, make uh, Democrats lead um, uh, by a really um, landslide victory. And then here, uh, people were really um, very um, impressed to understand uh, that um, Latino vote was, um, that it was just uh, way more complex than this, than uh, that um, this economy, the economy um, topic was playing in Latino communities as well, that it was not something which um, goes away because, and then we had to, to kind of, um, constantly ask us what does that mean for Germany or Europe um, because not only Trump or the Trumpism is not going away but what are the takeouts of this mm. election for here and then it's way m less um, comforting, um, comforting than uh, we could think at the very first moment. One of the contributions, one of the questions that we received from these young networks of, of these organizations uh, w was about media coverage 
of the Trump administration in Germany. And I'm just going to read it out uh, as it's written. Uh, President Trump has received unfavorable media coverage for the most of his presidency. Would you consider the German media landscape biased concerning its coverage of the U.S. presidential election? Uh, no, I think for the election, um, the coverage of the election, I think um, all German uh, networks really um, paid uh, a lot of... Um, so they, they tried to avoid all kind of mistakes, but, uh, and this could be behind the, uh, the question, it's more how did we report on the four years of the pr Trump presidency? And there maybe there's a, gr a grain of truth, um, uh, which means that um, the style um, of President Trump um, um, served as an excuse for uh, German media and German politicians uh, at the same time to kind of uh, avoid the the um, the real uh, the truth um, in a lot of statements or um, yeah statements the president was making so put it the other way around um, president trump uh, were easily used as an excuse for not asking some questions or not stepping up uh, and deliver things. And if the question was in that direction, I think for the media coverage right here, no, but for the coverage of the four years of the presidency, yeah, I think we could in some parts do it better. And before we move on to like the policy implications and how, uh, you know, where things go from here, just to, uh, w one more question to you maybe, Wojciech, uh, concerning Poland's reporting also on the Trump administration. Just uh, wondering how that was there. Did you, did you sense that overall it was uh, it critical, um, negative, uh, balanced? As I said, uh, as I said before, P Poland has this very, very divided media media landscape, with with the government media being very pro pro Trump and the others being very, very critical about uh, about Donald Trump. Um, but it must be difficult to be critical about the Trump administration, even for <laughs> people who m might not be with the government. Uh, on like issues like security, very much. It's a very, it's a very uh, complicated issue for for, for Poland because. Uh, for Polish security, uh, okay, this is also not so. It, it, it is not so clear. Donald Trump paid a lot of attention to Poland. He was moving their American troops, uh, planning also to move some troops from from Germany to to Poland. Uh, Poland had excellent uh, uh, relations with, uh, with 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 Washington. But on the other hand, uh, Donald Trump, uh, 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 Donald Trump's attitude towards towards NATO, which is a, a fundament, a cornerstone of Polish Polish security uh, as well, uh, uh, was a big was a big problem for for the for the liberal or more internationally thinking part of the Polish political uh, elites. So. Indeed, it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated situation for Poland itself. President Trump uh, was not the worst. What could have what could have happened? Poland Poland had very very good position there, but uh, it, it, I think it was a mistake. Donald Trump will be gone in a few months, and what's there? Donald Trump will be gone in a few months. Yeah, uh, it's assumed that on January 20th, Joe Biden will be sworn in, uh, take the oath of office, and become the next president of, of the United States. And the question is, what will happen then? What will? What are the implications of that for uh, transatlantic relations? For relations with Germany, with with Italy, with Poland, and, and all the other countries, with the European Union as, as a whole. Uh, and that's what I'd like to spend the rest of this uh, time focusing on. What's going to be different, uh, not just in terms of policy, but also for all of us as journalists? You know, what's going to change? What do we expect to change? What do you, what do you expect is going to change? Let's start with, uh, with, with you, Tonya. Yeah, I'm sorry I anticipated it, but I was so that's curious okay. to, to listen also to my colleagues about this, because well, I think China will be a big, big topic, and uh, I mean the, conf the confrontation won't go away. No, uh, uh, we know that the Europeans also uh, woke up because we saw this uh, 
uh, for example, uh, this this great summit which was um, uh, the, which which Angela Merkel had planned for this year, uh, it was uh, cancelled and then it was postponed. But I think one of the reasons, but Tina will uh, of course. This is the uh, EU China. Yeah, summit. the EU China. Yeah. One of the reasons was that she wanted a real agreement this time with China. Uh, about the investment, no? I mean, this is a topic going on. We have been he hearing about this for years and years. Uh, Europe always having, um, I don't know, a, a weak position, China. And, and now, so, so Trump, I think, inaugurated something new. Uh, and now we can go shoulder on shoulder with Trump in a, in a sort of uh, dialogue with China, uh, who is expansionary on the military and on the commercial side. Um, but there are t some topics that I think will, will play a role. For example, I don't think that... Um, uh, the, the question of the 2% of defense expenditure will go away. You know, I mean, this was a topic Turning for later. Trump, but this will also be, a, I think, a topic for, for, for Biden. And how will, will Europe respond? Because until now, it didn't respond really to this. Or also, I think the energetic um, question will be a big question because, or, um, uh, I mean, not only Nord Stream, no, but um, also other questions, how will, how will, um, I was thinking also the other day, the, the, for example, what was very important for Germany was the uh, Iran, Iran deal, no? The Iran deal with mm -hmm. the... Uh, and on this, maybe there could be a change. Um, so I think there are many inter di different and very, very interesting questions, but I don't think that all the problems, as, as someone said before me, will go away and we will go to back to the whole... To the, to the, paradise of, I don't know, no, the lost paradise uh, <laughs> of the relationships. Lost paradise. Uh, th that uh, has, sounds interesting. M Melissa, you, you, know, you kind of have both perspectives. You've been living in Europe now for quite some time. Uh, you're, of course, American. The, I'm just wondering how, how you see things uh, shaping up there, and what, do you, what are you expecting in terms of changes in the transatlantic relationship with the Biden administration coming in? There's some very clear priorities that have uh, you know, been laid out already in, in the speeches we've uh, heard from Biden and, and others. We, you know, we know that China is going to be an issue, uh, NATO you know, relations, defense, security, trade, uh, these, these are going to be issues. But what are, what are, what are you expecting to really change? Um, what I expect will really change is much more big picture. Um, I think we're going to see a return to a uh, belief in international institutions mm -hmm. that has not happened uh, under the Trump administration. This includes NATO, uh, where there's always been this question mark the past four years. Will he pull out? Won't he pull out? Where are we at with it? Um, I think it is entirely correct that the expectations on Germany in particular, on the European partners in general, to do their part in NATO is going to be enormous. And I think um, there's going to be a, a new view of, of Germany that, you know, it's no longer a protectorate. Germany is a powerful country in the middle of Europe, and now... Economically powerful, militarily... Economically <laughs> militarily weak, by by choice, right? But like economically powerful, and therefore it is time that Germany stops just waiting for the United States to take the lead on everything. I think there's going to be more of an equal expectation coming from the side of a Biden administration along the lines of, uh, yeah, we've got your back on certain issues, but we need you to have ours and not just be waiting for us. Um, I do think it's so fascinating, the whole 2% thing. I was listening to Deutschland Funk this morning, and you know, here was a pastor talking about the 2%. That as well. You know, I'm, I'm going to be hard-pressed <laughs> to find a pastor in the United States that's preaching these days about NATO's 2%. You know? <laughs> and so you know, these, some of these fundamental things are not going to change. But I think there will be a new basis for renegotiation, and I think the expectations um, on Germany in particular and on the Europeans are going to be higher. And one thing I just think, you know, we have to be also, we as journalists have to be responsible in perpetuating this narrative of back to the good old days. I mean, was the good old days when, you know, the Germans were marching, marching against, you know, Pershing missiles? Were the good old days back when they were protesting against, you know, uh, the Iraq war and Schroeder standing up saying that with us? I mean, let's not you know, be overly romantic about what happened before. This has always been a relationship, mm -hmm. and every relationship comes with its trials and tribulations. Now, the one other thing that I think is really interesting, Wojciech was talking about the Trump paid a lot of attention to Poland. 
Trump paid a lot of attention to Germany, okay? Like, let's not kid ourselves. It was not Negative. positive <laughs> attention. It wasn't <laughs> exactly. But it was attention. And I think for Germany, there is a risk of, I'm just going to call it like toddler syndrome, right? Like the little kids that the only time they get their parents' attention is when they're screaming and kicking on the floor, and then, you know, they get yelled at, and it's this idea of any attention, even if it's negative, is attention. And I think that's part of what I mean when, you know, Germany is going to have to find its own feet in a responsible role, because even the negative attention, you know, was attention. Mm. <laughs> if I could just, I, I couldn't agree more, um, actually, because, I mean, I think for, um, for Germany, the upcoming month um, and, and, of course, the upcoming year will be a tremendous uh, challenge because, um, first of all, no more excuses there if a president, upcoming President Biden is asking the same things like Donald Trump asked before, you just could not say no anymore. Um, so this is uh, something different. Then um, till now, and this is my major criticism um, towards all German governments uh, and coalitions uh, so far is that they all are constantly avoiding uh, um, an honest debate on Germany's role um, in the world and what that would mean. And it's always like, oh, Germans don't like that and it's not very good and selling for upcoming elections. I don't think that anymore. And I mean, um, if you see uh, polls coming up from young Germans, um, they ask for it and I think they could digest uh, an honest debate. Uh, this is second point. And third point, and just to mention it to my European colleagues, because you probably might not know how affecting this is for Germans. Um, for years and years, uh, I mean double ditch, that we have that Chancellor Merkel um, and she won't be there in this moment when Germany has to face a new role and has to face um, reality. And so, and, um, so far until the uh, uh, next year, we don't even know who are the leading figures um, going to this election time. And this is uh, either, this could really harm uh, and hinder um, this discussion uh, which Germany has to face or it could be an opportunity because this nursing uh, factor of um, good old um, uh, Chancellor Merkel um, keeping away everything which could unsettle uh, the German public w won't be there anymore um, or it could help. Uh, I, for me, it's still an open debate. I don't know. Well, um I totally, I totally agree. Uh, and uh, asking what will what will change? I would say the temperature will change, and I don't mean only the fact that Europe and U.S. will again try to work together on uh, pa Paris, uh, Paris climate agreement, and uh, and so on. Uh, it will be warmer. The relations will be warmer, I guess, between Washington and between between Europe. They will be more predictable. Uh, they will be more t more adult. They will be on this level. Uh, the way they were before, they were not. Uh, the, the, it was not the, the Mr. Trump's. Uh, it, it will not be Mr. Trump's diplomacy anymore. But the issues uh, which were also articulated by Trump's administration, they will of course not disappear. They are. They are there. And uh, America, the U.S. Uh, will not pivot its its attention now towards towards Europe. That's the, the, that that will not come anymore. It, it will go. The attention will go towards China, and the uh, U.S. will uh, be uh, uh, willing that Europe takes care uh, of itself more, and that Europe uh, spends more money on it, and Germany um, uh, among them. Uh, among the other countries, spends more money for for the security, and that Europe will be able to take care about its neighbourhood, about the, the the Middle East, uh, about the the the, the, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, and all this stuff, and not always waiting for uh, for for uh, uh, Americans. Um, so I guess these issues are are there, and uh, new administration will uh, will articulate them. Just the way maybe they articulate them will be. Uh, a little bit different. There was an op-ed piece yesterday from the former Chancellor Gerhard Schleder uh, where he said that Donald Trump effectively pulled the plug on transatlantic relations. Uh, Gerhard Schleder was mentioned here during his uh, chancellorship, German-American relations hit a new 
new low point. Uh, Condoleezza Rice is National Security Advisor. I recall her saying that describing relations as being poisoned, that was the word she used, because of Germany's opposition to the uh, Second Iraq War. And Chancellor Schroeder at that point said that Germany had emancipated itself from the United States. Now, this was considered at the time also not to be quite, quite on the money, but we're hearing now from Chancellor Merkel uh, a few days after the election took place, where she made her statement, made a qu very brief statement, uh, rec recognizing Joe Biden's win. And she said in that statement some, something I found really interesting. She said that, that Germany and Europe would now have to take on more responsibility in the world and to stand up for its convictions in the world. How do you guys interpret that? What is that going to mean moving forward? If I might go first uh, <laughs> on that topic, I think it means two things. If you, uh, if you refer to the second quote, um, stepping up and, and standing for um, con convictions and, and, and democracy, um, this is what I mentioned before. It's the, uh, probably there had been the hope uh, in Germany that um, under the President Trump, um, Germany um, should go a little bit and um, first front and, and upholding the West and then the next current administration could then take over the lead and Germany could go back. And what they now know is, and what she kind of underlines it, it's a common way of um, upholding the West with everything that means and that there will be a lot of expectations um, to Europe and to Germany. First part of what she said is, and this is a current um, dispute in the, in, the, in the government as well, what does that mean? Uh, because everyone says, yeah, yeah, we have to st do more, but um, as soon as um, you ask, uh, yeah, but what would that mean? Um, uh, so it's it's kind of more complicated than you have. There is the divided government in Germany. It must be pointed out. And as you've already said, Chancellor Merkel will not be there after next September. No, she won't be there. Uh, she has um, Kram Karrenbauer having a lot of good ideas. What that would and could mean, but no more right now. The power in that current administration to deliver. But to say so, I think the next upcoming government, um, at least if you see the majority so far, could be, could be um, um, the um, CDU um, and um, uh, black and, and green government, meaning to be together with the Green Party. And the Green Party, if you look closer, what they are, they are way more willing to um, take um, steps and, and going further than right now the, the current um, partner in the administration. Also in defense? Also in defense, way more, um, as long as you have the right mandate. The mandate thing, because I mean, you have to underline that we have a parliamentarian army and that every mission has to have the mandate from um, the parliament, which makes things more complicated. But on the other side, it's good because you have the, you, you could have the right discussions. So, and then it's uh, complicated when you don't have the UN mandate. And so you need a different mandate. If it's not mandated by the UN, then maybe a kind of European or international mandate others than the UN mandate. Here it's Complicated, but the Greens are going further down. And if, as you mentioned, Schröder, I mean, the first um, Schröder um, and um, the, the, the red green government, the first one, the former um, um, foreign minister, uh, Fischer, Joschka Fischer, he, he had not even found his, uh, um, his bureau so far and sit down uh, at the office. And then he had already to take. Um, risks and, and go for the first um, military uh, practice in the Balkans at that time. And so this could happen once again, you have the, the new, pro probably possibly new government. So there, there will be some, some pressure there. Uh, just to continue with that metaphor, if Donald Trump pulled the plug on transatlantic relations, will Joe Biden put it back in? What do you think? Well, I think there will be a dialogue again, but I think first that Europe has to solve the fundamental question, what does it mean to be responsible for itself? Does it mean that you are autonomous uh, also looking at NATO? Because this was a big fight in Europe Strategic in the last few autonomy years, is, no? a, is exactly. a word that you're hearing a lot in Brussels these days. Second, maybe because I come from a country which is thrown into the Mediterranean Sea, but what I saw in these last years, and 
this questions Europe a lot, and also NATO, is more and more proxy wars in the Mediterranean, in the, in the Middle East, uh, who are, uh, of course, where the last one is now in Asia, is it's between uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia, but we have had the same scenario in Syria, and for us, very important also for the migration question, is Libya. So we have these wars where uh, Russia mingles in very heavy, heavily, and so um, also the, this, this situation in the Mediterranean, which is, I think, it is often forgotten here, because it's Libya is a, topic, is a super topic, and I often also ask the politicians here, but they seem more interested in other things. And I think this is very important that, that Germany um, takes a, a more a leading role also in Europe on these questions. What is happening in, in the countries no? like Libya, like Lebanon, like Syria, like uh, Armenia and Ar Azerbaijan? Because um, it's true, Merkel won't be here next year. And by the way, the European, the, the southern European uh, countries are very scared about some alternatives, which we very are talking about, about now. For example, about Friedrich, Friedrich, uh, a man like Friedrich Merz being chancellor, because uh, many people in Italy think, and also I think in Greece and in, in, in Spain and Portugal, that we will go back to the problems that we had in certain settled, no, uh, in the financial crisis, you know, about this is eternal um, um, not believing in what, what these countries can do in terms of debt and, you know, all the debt the crisis. The north-south divider. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is not a secondary question for us. For Italy, it's a primary question who will be in its next chancellor. Well, check a potential well, for putting the plug back in. Yeah. How do you see it? Well, you know, I think four years of President Donald Trump has shown us that there is no turning back to the situation where the U.S. is the world uh, policeman and the world gendarme, which is taking care of, of, of the security in the, in the world. Uh, America doesn't want, uh, as far as I, uh, I, I guess so, Melinda, correct me if I'm wrong, I think America doesn't want to do it anymore, doesn't have the money, doesn't have the will to, 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 to have wars everywhere, everywhere in, the, in, the, in the world. That's why there is this big expectations towards Europe, just take care of yourself. Um, but so there, is, there will be no coming back to the, the Cold War is, is over, it's, it, we're not in the 90s anymore, uh, that uh, we won't have the situation with the US being just uh, the, 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 the big brother and taking care of, uh, taking care of Europe. But this is, uh, this is something very difficult for Europe because we are not the United States of Europe, we are European Union, we do not have an, an army. Uh, it's so difficult to agree on an on a EU budget. Uh, EU is so unable to to act on an international uh, on an international level um, it, it's well, may, I, may i may i contradict you because we have had i think a great great example of europe acting altogether on the recovery fund on the helps for the for the covid crisis and i think the ecb what the ecb is doing i think this was a, f a fundamental year for europe uh, also internationally uh, to demonstrate how close it stayed and how solidarity, how, solid, how much solidarity was expressed to the countries most, hidden, most hit by, by COVID. I don't think that this is true. I mean, we have much more standing in Europe now than we had one year ago. Yes, but uh, I see it as uh, Europe taking care with its internal problem, like helping each other inside of, of Europe during the pandemic. That's true, and this was something remarkable, the, what, what you were talking about. But the ability to act internationally, also militarily, mm. uh, with, a, with, a, with, with troops, uh, who should, who should con conduct them? Uh, uh, United Kingdom with its powerful army is not the EU anymore. Uh, it's France with its more, most powerful army. Army right now, but we've had this discussion about European army for for years, and and, and this is the question: Is Europe uh, ready to take care of itself? Yeah, but a little optimistic uh, um, to add a little bit more optimism to what you say, and I don't contradict you at all. But Mali could be a test case, and is a test case that Europe as a whole is taking more um, responsibility to solve conflicts in um, in in the um, closer region. There's some you know, interesting items in the, in the new budget, uh, the European Union budget uh, coming up regarding security. There's a whole separate discussion about that. Of course, that's being held in, in lots of other forums very similar to this. But getting back to transatlantic relations 
what we can expect from the new government in the new White House administration and in relation to the European Union, because if you're talking transatlantic relations, you're talking not just bilateral relations, you're talking relations between the United States and the European Union. The, Uni the European Union does still have some friction within its organization. It is not the United States of Europe, as you pointed out. It does not have its own military. There are disagreements on a number of things. For example, the rule of law right now concerning the budget, Poland and Hungary uh, opposing that right now. But I'm just wondering, Melissa, when, you know, because you've been back and forth across the Atlantic a lot and watched how all this has evolved, uh, do you see, under an Obama administration, an, an opportunity, uh, sorry, not Obama, to a Biden administration, a more opportunity for like, healing some of the divisions also within Europe in terms of getting, getting people on the same page? Or do you think the uh, Biden administration could exacerbate existing tensions? Hmm. It's an interesting question uh, because Biden, of course, has come on to the U.S. domestic stage really talking about unity and wanting to unify, and uh, I think that's going to be um, a dominant element of, of, his, um, of his program domestically. In terms of Europe, uh, I think we have seen that he sort of strategically you know, reached out and, and spoke to some, some of the Europeans. Um, I think... The one thing I think Europeans need to be really cautious about is that, like, there's a lot on Biden's plate at home. He's dealing with a tremendous coronavirus, and and I think this idea of really needing Europe to come together and, and be a partner and not needing the United States to take care of them in that sense is really going to be overwhelming. And and. The question will be, is Europe as a whole then up to that task? If they are, then um, I think it could possibly bring them together. But uh, as Tina has been saying, until we really know what's going to happen, how the election in 2021 here in Germany is going to play out, um, and we've already heard from, you know, as the Europeans, I found it fascinating to listen to my colleagues discuss everything just because bringing in these different perspectives. Um, it, it, that, that is going to be almost as important for Europe's future, if not more important, than whatever role um, we see Biden playing, I think. Hmm. And just to add, the year after our election, France will have elections. So we will have uh, a continuous um, way of uh, critical time slots to really, yeah, which is not helping. And it's somehow clear that Joe Biden is there only for four years. It's very... Uh, hmm. uh, not probably he won't, exactly. he won't be there for, 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 for eight years, which also makes it more, more uh, difficult. But I guess uh, what, will not, what will not really really change in this transatlantic relation, I think that uh, the, the issue of NATO and 2% GDP, this of course will not disappear. Even Obama wanted this and uh, was appealing on European countries, come on, spend more money. But just the way he, he was saying that was, was different, not, not the way Mr. Mr. Trump uh, did. Um, I believe um, that uh, there will be a discussion and there will be a, a, a Washington and, and, and Brussels will try to find an agreement on, on the World Trade Organization, how to how to reform it, uh, not just trying to, to kill it. Um, I believe Washington will still uh, expect uh, or even, even more expect Europeans to be on its side in the confrontation with, uh, with China uh, in this economical and maybe political uh, confrontation. Um, uh, what's interesting for Poland, I don't think that Mr. Biden will now stop, uh, will now become a fan of Nord Stream 2. I, 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 don't, I don't expect that. He uh, already before was criticizing this, um, was criticizing this, uh, this, this project uh, and because Mr. Trump was so attacking uh, Nord, Nord Stream 2 so, so, so harshly, that's why also Polish government liked Mr. Trump, Trump so much. So I guess the issues are, will, be, will be there, but the, the, the temperature and the, the, the warmth of the, of, the, of the communication and this trust in each other and this predictability 
uh, is something what we will uh, win in the in the upcoming upcoming years. But yeah, what's not good for predictability and trust is that uh, uh, Angela Merkel will be gone in one year. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with Macron. Uh, Joe Biden will be probably gone in four years. So it's it's not the best time for huge uh, plans. And ha also as has been pointed out, the the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on budgets uh, is going to be so significant, it will limit uh, the ability of, uh, to, to act in some ways. Go ahead. No, I wanted to, to, to add a question because uh, the, 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 uh, the, the biggest threat will be gone maybe, which was tariffs, no? I mean, on, on the economic, on the commercial. And I think it was a, a, a Damocles word, particularly for Germany, this, this automotive uh, tariff that was always agitated by Trump. But the question of the uh, commercial surplus of Germany will not go away either, because this was something that also already irritated uh, Trump, uh, Obama. And uh, I think after the crisis, we will go, and this is another great topic that is not discussed, but Germany will come out of the crisis very, very strengthened, streng uh, stronger than, than the other countries. Um, and, and this, I mean, this inequality, it's a problem in the ECB, they're speaking about it. And, um, and so I think this, this is another question. I mean, uh, the, 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 Commercial surplus will, will also be, I think, uh, um, an obstacle to uh, uh, no, a, a relaxed relationship between uh, the United States and, and Germany. There are some really big strategic uh, issues uh, here, and Nord Stream 2 has been mentioned several times, this controversial pipeline project between Germany and Russia that was started during the Schröder administration, which, which Merkel inherited, and of course, very, very controversial. Oh, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss it. We could do another hour and a half on that very easily, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but there's a, there's a question that was raised by, again, one of the youth groups associated with these organizations that I found really interesting uh, for you, Tanya, that I'm going to put to you, and that says that, the question is this. During the time of Silvio Berlusconi, former uh, prime minister, Italy was in a similar situation to the US now, in that much of national politics was about the character of the president. What could the US, and especially the Democrats, learn from Italy and Berlusconi's opposition back then? I think nothing, because Berlusconi wasn't beaten by the opposition, this is the, Sad reality. Well, by the way, uh, I mean, Berlusconi was one of the first to, to congratulate to Biden this time. So he's, yes, he's trying now to, to profile as a statesman and as someone. Who but during was the election, I mean, when he finally was out of office, it was all about him. It was all yeah, about yeah. getting rid no, of No, and I think also that, I mean, the, the, the Berlusconi populism was a sort of avant garde, and, and the Trumpism can be interpreted li like a sort of aberration of the populism, of the Berlusconi populism. So it's the businessman turned politician who hates politics and politicians, who goes to the government to save the people because he has been working his whole life. It's the same rhetoric. And we, of course, we, um, in that Europe, which was much more uh, ingenious, we, we, were, we were treated like a, a special country and a special uh, that couldn't be relied on and so on. But I think in that time, the, the problem was not Berlusconi, the problem was the opposition. But what came after Berlusconi is very interesting, and how that went down. And I think that's what this question. Well, is about. after that, we had again, we have again a sort of a, a form of populism which is avant-garde because the five-star populism is not a left star, leftist populism. It is a mixture of everything. It's conspirationalist, it's uh, leftist, it's right. It has some. It mingles a little bit of every populism. No vax, you know. So we're asking ourselves now, they are in the government, what would they do with the vaccine? <laughs> no, I'm joking, of course they are, now they are all um, settled with it. But, um, so again, I mean, uh, we didn't learn anything, I think, from Berlusconi, because still we have a very, very strong um, populist um, component in the, in the, in the, in the, in, no, in, in the politics, because you have the Five Star Movement, you have the Liga Nord, you have the, fi uh, the these new, um, uh, very right-winged um, movement, and in this panorama, Berlusconi looks like, really, uh, the, I don't know, the, the CDU of, of Italy. So, I don't know, um, we experienced this, and it was very harmful for the position of Italy. Also, I'm going back to the Mediterranean, but Italy had always, for decades, a very strong role in the Mediterranean. We have lost this completely, and 
I'm repeating mis myself, and I know it's it's not uh, uh, in, a, a topic for a, an Atlantic discussion, but it is a topic for the for the European future. You know what would happen in the Mediterranean, and we lost totally our touch there. And this is a problem. So uh, we only have a few minutes left, un unfortunately, and in this time, I want to ask you to give me what you see as the main opportunities that you find with the change of administration in the UL, in the US for rebuilding relations which have been damaged between the US and Europe. Uh, let's start with you, Melissa, if you're okay with that. No, I think we should start with the Europeans. Let's, I, yeah. I want to get my colleague's opinion first. Okay, well then let's, no, let's start. I, I, Go I ahead, so. Tina. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I think the, the main opportunity is that we have, um, or will have in the White House, uh, a new president and an administration uh, that we do know or where we can talk to. Who are, We have a partner um, and uh, who doesn't consider the EU as an, as a, as a, as an enemy, as a foe, that uh, was the as term a foe that yeah, exactly. Trump used. Uh, so there is an, uh, uh, there are open arms, and but then um, we have together from both sides of the um, the uh, Atlantic proof and and put the test case and and proof that multilateral multilateralism is working, mm -hmm. and which is not an easy one, and it's not just about talking about convictions and talking about values, but um, in a very transactional way, uh, will a Biden administration and the European uh, Union bring out more concrete um, advantages or not um, um, that democracy is working and that multilateralism is working? And I think this is the tough one. Well, I think allies will be allies again, which is not... Uh, not, not that. And then I think there will be a big topic that will be discussed in next year, which is climate change, of course, where I think we can imagine a much uh, stronger convergence between Europe and the United States. Um, and I also think, I mean, uh, the dialogue will be the world. I mean, I think this difficulty to have a, a contact with the administration will, will be gone and of course we won't have a president in, in, in the United States that tries to divide Europe because this was one of the characteristics I think of Trump. He tried to no, to always to have a good relationship with Poland to irritate Germany or to irritate other countries. He tried to uh, do it the same with Italy, dividing them from the rest of Europe. This was a divisive U president also for the European relationship, very strongly divisive. So I think we're going to have better four years now. Better four years. So just on the climate uh, issue, Joe Biden has, has made it clear that on the day that he becomes president, he would hopes to have the United States rejoin the Paris uh, Agreement on fighting climate change, and I believe also he wants it to rejoin the WHO as, as, as quickly as yeah. possible, the World Health Organization. Yeah, I would say it's a it's an opportunity to to renew the transatlantic structure and multilateralism structures, which which were damaged, but. Uh, I'm not talking about just building them back, but renewing them, just uh, uh, preparing them for the new opportunities, for the new, uh, f for the new challenges. Uh, what I said before, it's not about coming back to what we had before, uh, before, before Trump. There has to be a new uh, attempt on, on for, for, for NATO, for international m military cooperation, for cooperation on climate. Uh, I, I think we should use these four years just to to build some new transatlantic relation and not just try to reanimate to the the, the one that has uh, almost died. <laughs> what would that look like? That's a very good question. Um, uh, I was thinking about it well when, 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 when saying it. Yeah, just making it uh, making it looking to the future, not so much not so much looking looking to the uh, looking to the back. Um, uh, that's a good question for all the all the think tankers and <laughs> the political <laughs> experts how to how to do it. But I, I, I think that Donald Trump has become president was a kind of a proof that. Uh, and what he was able to do with uh, the United Nations, with uh, with World Trade Organization, with uh, a Paris Climate Agreement, has shown that maybe it's not it's not working right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we we have exactly four minutes left. Um, the, the look, let's look down the road. Uh, let's think four years from now. Um, 
what, what, what can we expect four years from now? Uh, so Joe Biden has been in office for four years. How old will he be at that point, Melissa? Old enough to run a country. Oh, still old <laughs> enough to run a country? Okay. Some, some are wondering, though, may, maybe whether he'll be handing off, whether, whether Donald Trump might come back. What do you think? I think at this stage of the game, we have so much ahead of us right now with a new Biden administration coming in. Like, let's not put carts before horses. Let's focus on rebuilding the multilateral institutions that are out there. Let's focus on Europe taking a stronger new role, on accepting that the Cold War is now part of history and we have a future ahead of us. How are we going to build it? What can we do in the four years that we have this opportunity to, to build it? And, and then, you know, U.S. elections take up enough of our, of our brain space as our journalistic energy. Like, we have one behind us. Let's not start another one four years down the road. There's a great German expression, nach der Wahl ist vor der Wahl, right? Uh, after the election is before the election. So one begins to begin to think, think further uh, if, it, if it's a divided Congress and we just don't know how that's going to play out just yet. Uh, what are your predictions uh, going forward? How, how smooth do you think we're going to, the, uh, the Biden administration will be able to roll out its policy agenda to you? Well, I mean, there is still uh, -a Europe. Yeah, a very important, yeah, but uh, Europe um, uh, knows that uh, there is still, uh, the Senate race is still open and that probably some of these very tense um, statements right now might uh, soften a little bit once that uh, this race is over. Um, but um, thinking ahead a little bit, uh, as you said and, and, and asked us to do, I think, um, um, I think Europe, uh, the EU is on crossroads and um, uh, whatever um, might be how successful or unsuccessful the, the Biden presidency might be and um, that really, I, I really mean that in a very deep way because I mean either we are turning back to be more a trade um, union um, and, and <laughs> kind of let go all the, 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 the sweet talking and the ambitious uh, way of um, being a partner and a player um, in international role or um, there will be kind of accelerator um, and I hope so and for Germany I think there will be some kind of accelerator. I think we will see a more precise uh, stance on China because uh, Euro Germany at least is very frightened to wake up uh, at the wrong side. If there is decoupling, they don't want to stay with China and not be with the United States. This is one thing. Uh, I think that the question of not just the 2%, this is, I mean, this is uh, something but about capability and it's readiness. It's been agreed upon anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, but I think that we have to step up and do more for our defense, that free lunch is over. I think this is really now uh, the new normal here. So, I think we are on a crossroads but I'm still more optimistic that we might go to the right direction. That's a great note to end on, an Thank optimistic you. note. Uh, I <laughs> want to from a German, no less. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> there is hope. It, uh, it may be an, a new beginning of some kind for sure. Melissa Eddy, Tina Hassel, Tonya Mastroboni, and Wojciech Szymanski, thank you all four for being with us today and for sharing your insights. Uh, I just want to mention before we go that the there's a transatlantic conference that's going to happen uh, in this discussion series uh, on November 20th, on Inauguration Day, the very day that uh, Joe Biden is to be sworn in as U.S. President. So please do... Hmm? January, not November. Sorry, January. January. I'm, I'm <laughs> getting, getting behind myself here. So, no, January. 2021, I think. I'm hoping that's, that's where we're heading and not any later. Uh, so do join us for that. I'm Terry Martin. Thank you for being with us and thank you to all our sponsors. Thanks also to the, the governing mayor of Berlin and the Berlin Chancellery for, for hosting this event. Um, tune in again. <laughs>